<laughs> yeah, so I think we're about to begin. Um, I'll just give them a bit more. It's so 14. Okay, so I think we can kick off. Um, the room is filling in still, but we can just kick off. Wonderful, Gustav. So, yeah, so I'll just um, welcome everyone here. Uh, nice to see you all here this afternoon. Um, I'm calling in from your host, calling in from Cologne, and Steve. He's uh, going to talk about DICOM and FIRE today. He's calling in from Seattle. So without any further ado, I'll let him kick off. Wonderful. Thank Thanks very much, Gustav. I'm really excited to be here. And for those of you who have questions, I'll be hanging out in the Whova app and other places. And we'll leave time at the end for some good questions and Q&A as well. Um, let's get started. Uh, some of the learning objectives today, we're going to talk about why DICOM and why it belongs in FHIRE. I'm going to then introduce um, the, one of the Microsoft services that we've released in open source. It's available on GitHub today, called the Medical Imaging Server for DICOM, as well as DICOM CAST, an integration between DICOM and FHIRE. And we'll then do a little bit of exploration with the clinical and imaging data. We'll use Power BI for that. And I'll show you how to connect those two together. And then I'll give you some tips and tricks just for getting started on DICOMCAST. Then we'll jump into Q&A and let's get started. Fire and DICOM, why? Why the difference and why not just dump everything in fire? Well, let's take a look first at, at kind of the differences of what and what they do and how they belong together. So first, uh, FHIRE is a phenomenal repository for clinical data, um, information-centric workloads. Um, it really captures the whole patient. I and mean, we have insurance billing in there potentially. We have medications that they're taking. Um, we have visits and observations and diagnostic reports. We've got this massive amount of information that really gives us insight into who a patient is and their whole history. Um, DICOM, on the other hand, um, is very imaging centric. So it captures a lot of imaging data. Um, and you work in radiology clinics and other, other sorts of, of visual environments with DICOM and, and live in parts of patients. So we, you don't get necessarily a holistic view of a patient when you're looking at DICOM data, you're getting a subset. And that subset could be um, a chest CT scan where you're looking at someone's uh, you know, innards through a CT scan, or it might be an X-ray, or it could be you know, a visible light image as well. But the idea here is that DICOM is that subset. Now, why not just take all of DICOM and stuff it into FHIRE, right? FHIRE can hold images. Why not just make FHIRE the sole repository? Why integrate? There's a couple of reasons. DICOM is an extremely ex established standard. Um, if you find a DICOM image created in 1993, there's a good chance you can open it in pretty much any viewer today. And um, that standard has been around a long time. Um, there's an estimated four 0.5 exabytes of data um, in images, 450 to 500 petabytes of data created every year, growing at just a phenomenal rate. I've heard estimates ranging from 25% year over year growth to 100% you know, every five years. It's a lot and it's an awful lot of data. Um, so we need to keep DICOM separate. It's also completely well established in the industry. So we're gonna keep DICOM separate. And I wanna talk a little bit about how that integration then occurs. There are two major working groups making sure that FHIRE and DICOM play well together. Um, the first is HL7. And in the HL7 group, there's a group called Imaging Integration. And I'll link to this later, but it's an opportunity for you to jump in and understand what's happening in these collaborative worlds. Um, the 
Flip side on the DICOM, there's a DICOM working group 20. It's called the Integration of Imaging and Information Systems. And they work from the other side. And those two groups collaborate effectively to create inside of FIRE representations of DICOM metadata. And I'll show you a little bit about what that metadata looks like. Um, but the idea here is that we can't just stick DICOM into FIRE. Just, it's too established. It's too big. Um, and it's it really does live everywhere we see medical imaging. So here's a list of use cases of why you might want to integrate. Um, you might want to add imaging to other hospital systems. So a lot of times, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, one of the uh, customers I'm working with, they're in a stealth mode startup, but they, they basically have a, a phone app and a tablet app that runs around in the hospital and you can flip through a, a, a doctor, a nurse, anybody inside of a hospital can see their patients and understand what's happening. Um, but a lot of cases, a physician or a nurse or someone else may also want to see that imaging included. So they're getting a constant stream of HL7 messages, maybe converted to fire. And then in that, fire metadata that they're exposing in their app, they can also bring those studies directly onto that tablet so people can look at the tablet. Um, another area that I think is, is really important is adding imaging to reports. Now, you know, picture's worth a thousand words. We've heard it again and again and again, and that's definitely the case. And with DICOM, and in this case, DICOM Web, you can refer to a link for a particular image, say a JPEG image located on a DICOM server. And then you can render that inside of some report that's being pulled from potentially fire. So that allows us to keep that nice tight integration and do it in a way that's super clean. Um, in DICOM, there's a substandard called DICOM web. And I'll, I'll be talking specifically more about that in a moment. But from the DICOM web substandard, you have a lot of different ways to drill into um, some particular images. And the, the URL here I have as an example, some DICOM server, whatever that is. And then you're dr drilling into somebody's study, a series within that study, and an individual instance. And you're asking for it to be rendered, potentially as a JPEG, potentially as a bitmap, so that you can integrate that right into a report or right onto some screen or something like that. Um, another area that I find extraordinarily compelling for bringing imaging data into FHIR is because if that metadata is in FHIR and FHIR is acting as that backbone, we can start to query FHIR for things that are potentially really difficult to get answers to. Like I wanna find um, patients with mammograms who are diagnosed with benign lumps. And, and I'll actually show this as an example coming up. Um, and this ability to look at the whole patient and pull imaging in is very, very powerful. It's powerful, not just for physicians, but for radiologists to be able to understand what's happening. Um, and another area, and I've, I've got a quote on both of these last two that I'll talk about, but providing feedback back to radiologists. Um, fire is where everything is held, right? This is a solid repository for all that is medical about a patient. And we have this difficulty inside of radiology, especially teleradiology, where a radiologist might get an image. They might get this study, this inside of their picture archival system or some image viewer, and they'll go through and they'll look at the image and they'll make a recommendation. And that recommendation might be, we need a biopsy because I believe this to be, um, this tumor or this growth to be potentially cancerous. So what will happen is they'll submit that, it'll go back into the system um, and they will never find out if they were right. What we wanna do is close that loop and from fire, which knows when a biopsy has been returned, right? Because we've got billing for it, we've got an observation, we've got the physician making reports, all of those things tied into fire then can trigger that radiologist to come back and take a look and see what's happened. So those are just a small list of the use cases. There are many, many more, but it's a good 
small subset to get started with. And I want to focus on two examples. Um, these are actual quotes. And, and um, they're difficulties that people have experienced. And I'm going to talk about a researcher first, a medical researcher, um, asking this question. Uh, give me all the medications prescribed with all the CT scan documents and associated radiology reports for any patient older than 45 that has had a diagnosis of osteosarcoma over the last two years. This is an extraordinarily difficult question to answer if your clinical systems are in silos separated from your imaging systems. And when we dove into asking, well, how did you solve that? How do you solve it today? And literally the answer is, they go find all of these CT scan documents first, and they find any radiology reports, and then they, they find the, uh, the medications and the patients who have had a diagnosis of osteosarcoma, and then they try to correlate those two, basically a Venn diagram. Um, and that's not easy because you're running reports from both and getting thousands potentially of results of which only a few hundred will satisfy this need. So this is one area that I find extraordinarily compelling for taking that imaging and bringing it into fire. And the second one comes back to the last bullet um, that we talked about earlier, and it unlocks the teleradiologists. And, and this, again, direct quote, and I, it was really, you could just feel the pain. Uh, teleradiologists don't necessarily belong to hospital systems. So they can't just go log in and look at a patient to find out what their end result was. So in this particular example, the uh, radiologist said, take parathyroid, for example. We do more than any other clinic in the country. And yet I have to beg and plead for surgeons to tell me what they actually found. Out of the more than 500 studies I do each month, I get direct feedback on only three or four. That's less than 1%. Imagine, we're software de developers, right? We build and deliver software. Imagine if we could not close that feedback loop. If we didn't get feedback from customers, we didn't have unit tests. We didn't have tests that prove that our compilation was success. That successful. That feedback loop is what gives us the ability to improve our craft. And with teleradiology, we're potentially disassociating the teleradiologists from that feedback loop. Do they still do tumor boards? Absolutely. Do they still try to keep up to date with what's happening? Absolutely. But by closing the loop, which we can do with an integration with fire, we all of a sudden are able to answer some questions and help radiologists get better at their craft. So that's a couple of examples. And I didn't want to dive do too much. And I hope I didn't soapbox and too much on there, but I think it's really important. So I want to shift gears now. That's why we want to take that data, that, that imaging metadata that happens to be sitting in DICOM, and we want to push it into fire. So we're able to create these links between the two of them. Now, my role at Microsoft, one of my roles, I'm the director of medical imaging in a group in Microsoft Research. And my role is to make sure that we create a solid way to ingest medical imaging data seamlessly at scale, securely into Azure. Um, and what we have recently released is the medical imaging server for DICOM. I'll show it to you in just a moment. You can see on the right here, it's uh, open source, it's on GitHub, and it's available for anybody to take a look at and whatever you need to do with it, right? Fork it, make changes to it, whatever you like. And we'll show you how it works in just a moment as part of the demo. Um, but the idea for this service is to allow standards-based communication with Azure using DICOM Web. Now, I talked a little bit about the distinction between DICOM and DICOM Web, or I hinted at it earlier. DICOM Web is a more modern version of the DICOM standard um, from a communication protocol. So for instance, there's something called DICOM DIMSI, and we won't need to dive into that too much, but the protocol is very, very chatty, and it, it runs over a local area network. Um, it's been around forever. Since, the, since 1993, when DICOM 3 launched, uh, we're still on DICOM version 3, by the way, um, since DICOM launched, that standard has really been in place. And over the course of the last few years, um, there's been this explosion in the need to share imaging across organizational boundaries or even inside of an organization, but across local area network boundaries. And to do that effectively, 
um, people have shifted to using REST-based protocols over HTTP and HTTPS, and that is DICOM Web. And it's a standard like REST that, I mean, like it, you can think of DICOM Web is to DICOM as fire is to an HL7 message. And that, that communication, um, instead of being networked locally, is really meant to push it out, share globally, and use these systems, these standards that we're all very familiar with, like REST. So we've built on DICOM Web, and we have a DICOM Web endpoint. Um, one of our goals was for it to be you know, just trivial to do an installation in your, um, in your Azure tenant. Um, there's a button click deploy, you make a few choices, um, and you've got your up and running in less than five minutes. You can be deploying um, in pushing your medical images into Azure. But one of the things that I wanna talk about today is not just the medical imaging server for DICOM, but this integration between DICOM, medical, uh, DICOM imaging data and the metadata. And to do that, um, we've introduced something um, called DICOM CAST. And, and here's how it fits together. Um, we've got a fire server. The Azure API for fire um, is, a, is a service. It's a managed service that goes both open source, you can download it and execute it on GitHub, I'm from GitHub, or you can use our managed service in the cloud. You can just sign up for it and get a secure endpoint. In either case, the Azure API for Fire can hold all of that core um, data about the patient. And then you spin up a medical imaging server for DICOM that stores that medical imaging data. And you might connect that to a PAC system, to a vendor neutral archive. You might have your own medical imaging system. It might be a third party system. However you connect that or whatever you connect it to, it's simply going to speak DICOM web in the back end. So the medical imaging server will ingest that data. Now, if you've set up what, we're call, what we call DICOM cast, it will integrate the Azure API for Fire and the medical imaging server for DICOM. So as you upload data, it'll push that data appropriately into the fire service. Now, once you're in fire um, and you're in, and you have the imaging in DICOM, then you can, it, it lights up a whole bunch of capabilities. I'm gonna show you Power BI for patient cohort discovery, but it pushes you know, Azure Synapse, Databricks, you can push it to cognitive services, any type of machine learning, you can push it, and, and the machine learning is not limited to you know, just the capabilities in, um, for instance, Azure Synapse or Databricks, it's, it's any type of machine learning algorithm you wanna run against that. So that's kind of the vision and how it's done is through this DICOM cast piece. So, so on the left-hand side, you've got some ingestion and well, it can come from anywhere, but we're in, injecting, ingesting that data into the DICOM service. And that, that server itself, the medical imaging server for DICOM, exposes something called a change feed. And basically that allows anybody at any, well, not anybody, any authorized individual to look at a change feed API endpoint and see everything that has ever happened to the um, to the DICOM web server. So they can, they can go in and identify, you know, it, this image was, or this study was uploaded, um, these instances were uploaded, this metadata was changed, all of that stuff is captured in the change feed. So DICOM cast runs as a separate um, Docker container and it pulls periodically for a batch of changes. Um, once it understands those changes, it'll get a batch of changes and it will then reach out to Fire and say, hey, I've got a patient identified in this study and that patient looks like, you know, their name is, uh, you know, Stephen Borg. Uh, we've got someone whose patient's name is Stephen Borg. Here's their identifier, here's their birthday, here's their sex. Go find that patient in fire. And if we can find that patient and identify that patient in fire, we will then create a group of fire resources that we attach in a bundle and we push it to the fire service um, under that patient. Um, if we can't find a patient and the patient is not there, a couple options, but by default, we'll take that patient will create a patient based on the metadata that exists in fire. Um, so we can, we can push that data up. And then we wait for the next batch. Um, you can run, the, it can pull every three seconds, every three minutes, every 30 minutes, every, you know, whatever you need um, to grab that data and, and however quickly you need it to, to push that data into fire. And here's what it pushes into fire today. Um, it's part of that working group 20 and part of the HL7 imaging integration group. Um, they've created something in 
in R4, Fire R4, called the Imaging Study Resource. And it really reflects the way that, um, it really reflects the way that, that DICOM is organized. And there are pros and cons to the Imaging Study Resource. And there, there are things that are a little wonky about it. Um, and I can talk about some of those in the Q&A if people would like. But it very strongly reflects the way a study is structured inside of a, of a DICOM um, study. So inside of DICOM, um, you might come in as a patient and say, I need to, you know, I, I feel a little, you know, heart pain or chest pain or something like that. And they may drop you in and give you a CT scan. That work that they do is called a study. So you have a patient and they go through a study. And the study is made up of one or more series. Now, if I walk into the CT scan and they do a CT scan, that would be one series. They might also take a quick X-ray of my chest and that would be another series, but part of the same study, this chest pain study. And then inside of that, series of each series, you have instances. And these are the actual images, um, generally. They can also have frames, but we won't get into that too much. You have instances, which are the images. So in that CT scan, you might have five or 600 images if you're doing your whole chest. And each one is a slice of just a few millimeters through your entire chest. Um, if you're doing an x-ray, you'll probably just get one instance. And then there's a couple other pieces of metadata, like who performed the operation and things like that. And all of these things tie together to provide this instance, this imaging study resource that we can then inject into FHIR. And there's a couple of core elements of this, and we, we don't need to dive into too many of these, but just note that like anything else, like it's a, you know, there's a reference to a subject, so we tie it to the patient, and we tie it to the referrer, we tie it to whoever took that um, study, et cetera. Um, that's where we're at today and with the fire imaging study. And that's where the working group 20 and the HL7 groups have collaborated to create this imaging study resource. In R5, there's some potential changes coming up and uh, we can talk about what those, those are as well, but later in the Q&A. So I told you, I'm gonna jump into a demo. And, and I mentioned earlier that uh, it, this, this top thing, give me all the medications prescribed with all the CT scan documents. We, we talked about that one. Now, I don't have that data. Um, luckily, the Society for Imaging Informatics, SIM, um, had a hackathon three years ago. And so uh, the data is a little bit wonky. You have to convert it from STU2 to STU2 STU and STU3. It's kind of a mix into R4. But when you make that translation, you get a, a set of metadata that you can use. And I've translated that query into the following. And, and, I've, and I've highlighted it differently because I, I really want to stress there's a lot of different pieces. Give me all the medications prescribed with all the mammography imaging and their associated diagnostic reports. That's three things we're asking for. And we wanna filter it for any patient that's older than 45, has had a breast lump over the last, has had a breast lump, was diagnosed with a breast lump, and we wanna do it over the last 20 years. So we've got three filters and three pieces of data that we're really trying to identify from this. So that said, it's time to shift gears and get into a demo. And as we move to a demo, um, I'm gonna start off with the DICOM service itself. So I'm here in the DICOM server. Um, if you, you'll see the, uh, this is the github.com, WAC Microsoft, WAC DICOM server. Um, you can see recently, we yesterday, we updated some of the DICOM CAST documentation to help make it easier for you to, to um, jump in. Um, you can see the medical imaging server for DICOM. We're not gonna go through this too much, but I wanna just point your attention to some of these quick starts. So if you leave this session and you wanna see what it's like, this is how you get started quickly. And I'm gonna set up DICOM CAST. Now, um, normally, if this was production, you would set up a fire server, you would set up your, your, your uh, um, medical imaging server for DICOM, you would then deploy a DICOM cast, you'd connect the two together. I'm going to show you the stupid simple way to do it if you just want to get started with something quick, quickly. This is the deployment to Azure for just DICOM cast, but if you scroll down below, this is a simplified quick deploy. And by clicking this deploy to Azure button, I'm given just a couple things that I need to fill out. Um, just one moment while it logs me in.
And here for this custom deployment, I only need to identify a couple things. So I can create my own resource group. I might call this uh, you know, DCAS 2020 or something like that. Uh, this is a resource group. This is a group that's gonna hold the, uh, all of the data that we're working with, the, all of the, the resources that we need. We can choose a deployment target. I'll choose West US 2 um, and give it a service name. I'll do the same service name, SJB Decast 2020. And then this service name is gonna, it's gonna deploy three separate services. It'll deploy the OSS version of Fire It'll deploy the OSS version of the medical imaging server for DICOM, and it'll deploy DICOM cast as a container, all three of those. And they'll all be um, post fixed with like dash fire, dash DICOM, dash DCAST. So um, that's just kind of how it's deployed. It's all explained in the uh, documentation. And then provide an admin password and then review and create. Now I'm not going to go into into this. Um, it's we've got some resources. I've got some validation. You click create. It takes usually between two and four minutes. I average it out to three. Sometimes it goes a little bit longer than three. But that will give you a full deployment. And at that point, I'm going to go reach into the uh, you know oven and pull out the cake, if if you will. Um, I've got one that I've just deployed called uh, SJB Dicom Cast 10, and this is this is the actual site. You can see there's absolutely nothing here. Um, I have no, no matching results. If I look at um, what I've deployed, um, it's brand new, it's super clean, there's nothing there. Um, so I need to upload some DICOM images to that. Um, for interests of time, I'm just gonna jump into a Jupyter notebook and um, I've got a subset of files here. It's a, it's a, it's a list of only a hundred files. I've trimmed it down from um, several thousand or just over a thousand to only a hundred. A hundred is probably gonna only give us a portion of one study um, in this case, but I'm gonna store those to that service. So I'm gonna let this run for a bit. And what it's gonna be doing is pushing and uploading those documents up to that DICOM service. Now this is a brand new, super clean instance. There's no, um, there's no fire data in here. So I'm, I'm, I'm just showing you how it'll come up and create the fire resources as necessary. Now, this is gonna take a little bit of time to upload, upload these, not too long, but, but long enough that it's probably worth shifting gears and we can come back to this in a moment when, and, and just kind of you know, prove that there's nothing up my sleeves. So I'm now gonna not I'm gonna take another one out of the oven. Uh, maybe I'll take one out of the pantry, a cake that's already been frosted. Let's take a look here at a viewer that I have today. So this is a DICOM service, um, SJB DCAS 6 DICOM, and it's got a bunch that I have uploaded. I've uploaded about 8,000 some images. These are the images provided by SIM for their hackathon three years ago. And I've uploaded all of those images to this service. Additionally, prior to uploading this, so I, there is a little bit of something up my sleeves here, prior to uploading this, I, I pushed some of these characters into fire. So the inside of um, the fire service, I have Sim Andy and Sim Joe and Sim Ravi and Sim Neela, um, Sim Sally, all of these I pushed into fire first so that when I uploaded my DICOM files, they would link together with those existing ones rather than create new ones. Um, once we get it into fire, now I can show you from Postman that there, you know, that, that there's stuff in fire, but I want to show you a different way because I want to go now and answer that particular question that we started with. And that question I'm going to answer in Power BI. Now, once again, I'm going to have two examples, one getting the data, and then I'm going to show you the data already, you know, pre um, you know, laid out. It takes a while to lay out something that you might want to slice, how you might want to slice and dice the data, but I want to show you how I get the data. So I open up Power BI desktop and I just click get data. Um, and this is something that the fire team, uh, my sister team here in uh, Microsoft research put together. And I, I absolutely love it because it, it lets me slice and dice data in a really clean way. So I'm just going to get data from a fire service. And I'm going to connect to that fire service. And the URL for that is the, uh, is the URL that we had for before, https colon uh, whack whack. And I used SJB decast 
six dash fire because I used that quick start to push it up and it deploys to azurewebsites.net. And let's click okay. Now I didn't click to 10. If I, if I connected to SJBCast 2020 or 10 or the ones that I've just created, there would be just a little bit of data there because we've only pushed up that one, um, that one thing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna log in, I'm gonna log in here, get this going and connect up and pull the data into this service. Let's see. Should prompt me now for what type of data do I want? And the navigator lets me slice it. Right now, it's querying the fire service, looking at the capability statement and saying, what do you support? Now, I, I can pull several things. I'm going to want to pull, for sure, I'm going to want to pull a patient. Um, I'm going to want to pull the imaging studies, because those are the things that are linked to it. I might, I might also want to pull observations. Um, I, in order to do the other one I want to do, I'm going to have to pull medications and medication requests because those are the, uh, you know, the, the, we want to ask, the question that we wanted to answer is what medication and what medication requests. Um, so we can find that. And then I can simply click load and load that data. And it's going to pull that data um, right out of the fire service and bring it here where I can then slice it and dice it. Um, this takes a little bit of time. Uh, there's I, I loaded it up with some extra data, not just the you know five patients. I threw in some other patients. So I'm going to now quick shift gears and move over to take a look at our other Power BI. This is the one that you know I'm pulling it out of the you know, oven, if you will. Um, and we can see here um, what it looks like. I've, I've I've laid out a couple things. I can see that I've got people from all over the world. I can, I can um, drill into some of this data, maybe get a little bit closer um, into the data in, in the US where my hospital system is located. Um, one thing I might wanna do is I might just wanna slice this data. Let me, uh, let me do that right now. Um, we've see, you can see I've got 121 patients here, but if I, uh, if I go ahead and slice this data to say, only show me um, the data, the, the people in kind of this New England area. Um, you'll see that now we only have 86 patients sliced out of that. And we can, of course, drill down um, and, and, and get fewer and fewer patients. If I pull stuff from here, for instance, like if I highlight here, you'll see that I have no imaging studies from here. Um, in fact, all my imaging studies happen to be <laughs> in Rochester. So if I highlight Rochester, you can see I've got um, Andy, Ravi, and Sally live in Rochester. And then if I, if I grab more data um, down here, you'll see that I, I have Joe and Neela um, who have studies here. So you see I'm slicing and dicing this data. And then of course, given, um, you, you can slice it in any way, shape or form. I, I guess here's the, here's where the rubber meets the road, right? I can, once you're, once you have this data together, you can start to slice it and really understand that data. So I can, um, I, I'm going to, you know, zoom out a little bit. I want all of, I want all of this. So let me, let me uh, grab a, maybe a little bit bigger chunk. Whoops. So I can get uh, all of my characters and I can, I can take a look at these and I can then look at like Andy's um, CT. So if I click this button, it's gonna bring me um, to the viewer. Now, I, I do wanna mention, um, I've got this viewer um, and I, you know, this, I'm just gonna show this. It's, the, it's an OHIF viewer. Um, for those of you familiar with uh, medical imaging, this is a, an open source viewer. Um, we automatically, you can configure it that you can deploy the OHIF viewer when you deploy the medical imaging server for DICOM. Um, we don't recommend that you do that for your production deployments. You don't need a viewer. You know, your radiologist will have their own viewer, but it sure makes it easy to just see what's going on. So I, I, I pop this up here and then we can, we can kind of scroll through this image. We can kind of, this is that chest CT scan. You know, if I went in, you'd see my lungs here and I'm sliding from my shoulders all the way down to my pelvis here of the CT scan. And you can see these nodules in the lungs and you can see the spinal column, et cetera. So it's just an easy way then to get that data um, right there. So that's a, that's just an example. I wanna slip back now into, into uh, this study because I wanna go and answer that question. And I'm gonna go to meds, um, a different thing here. And here we have, you'll see we have our 18 studies. We have our 121 patient count. And we wanted to ask that question. You know, give me the medications, give me the mammography images, 
give me the diagnostic reports. And I want to filter on three things, any patient older than 54. So I can go in here to this age filter and I can go up and filter it out to say, you know, older than 54 would be 55 to 107. So we're going to filter that out. Now you see, we only have 52 patients. Okay. And you can see that now we have only two medications. I don't have a lot of medications in this demo. You know, we only had three, but you know, we lost acetaminophen when we got to here. We still have 17 studies. I can look at what those imaging studies are. And then I can slice a little bit further. Who's had a breast lump? So I can start searching for things like uh, breast lump. And that's going to filter us down even further. Um, we've only got one patient. We're not going to be running any machine learning algorithms off of this piece of data. But again, I only loaded five patients, so I don't have a whole lot to slice and dice through. But this is where you could create a cohort. So if you see here, I've got this, you know, four studies that, that have breast lumps. You can see here, we've got a surgical specimen. We've got a digital mammography. We can, of course, drill in now because we asked specifically for people over the age of 54, and we wanted to be able to see three things, all the medications. And it looks like the only medication that anybody who happens to have a mammography with a diagnostic report that re referred to a breast lump is levoxathyrine. So levoxathyrine is the only drug. So eh, is that, that related to um, you know, uh, breast lumps, benign breast lumps? Probably not, but who knows? This is the thing I wanted to find out. And so I can dig in and start to identify this. The other thing I need to be able to do is search for breast lump. And the one last thing is over the last 20 years, and in the diagnostic report, we have when the diagnosis was made. I didn't bother with that one because it's just another Power BI filter like this one where we slap it on again and it didn't quite fit. So I just left it off. But you can see, we can go look now at, we have the results, we have the, the, the actual diagnostic reports, and we can come in and we can look at the specimen that's provided by um, that particular um, removal of the lump from the breast. And so we can identify that, go in and actually get those images. Now, why does this matter? Here's one of the core pieces of why this matters so much. When you start looking at a radiologist and a radiologist is looking at one of those images, they may not know, they might be looking at it and going, ah, is that cancerous or is it not? And I just don't know um, because radiologists run into that problem daily. So what do they do? They rip open their books. They find some images that show um, examples of benign, examples of aggressive tumors, et cetera. And then they look at the image and they try to figure it out. What we can do today is go back to fire as a radiologist and say, you know what? Show me a bunch of examples of images where the final diagnosis has been a benign breast lump. And then I can look at my mammography images and compare those with actual images taken in my hospital with people who had benign breast lumps. And then I can say, okay, now show me aggressive cancerous ones that required a mastectomy. And then I can look at those and make that comparison as well. These are the core things that that integration can provide. So I get a little soapboxy here. Let me go back to let me go back a little bit to my slides. I'm almost wrapped, and we'll get into questions. Um, sharing my screen once again. I shouldn't have stopped sharing, but I just wanted to be there, um, like face to face, if you would. Um, let's let's pull back over and the demo's done and we've shown off how we might slice and dice that piece of data. So what's next? Um, it's a mistake to think that DICOM is simply a reference to a bunch of pictures. Um, that's one of the most important things DICOM is, but it's far more than that. Um, DICOM also has, um, you know, if you run your DICOM image through a machine learning algorithm that maybe outlines a tumor for you in three dimensional to give you some kind of, um, you know, sizing for a tumor. Um, that can be captured in a number of ways in DICOM. One is through something called DICOM RT, radio, uh, you know, radiation therapy. And that will give you the location and everything for that cancer so that you can beam it with radiation and kill it. Um, we also can return that, that, that outlining back in something called DICOM SEG, which is that just kind of an array that says, hey, here is 
the outline of the image and here's how it fits on the image. Um, it can come back as secondary capture. That means you know the, the, the AI might just you know draw a circle around it and literally copy the entire image with the circle and put it back into, into the DICOM file um, as another series. Um, and then there's structured reporting, there's um, PDF reports, all of these things that a radiologist does are fed into DICOM as part of the standard. And we need to grab more of those. So that's what's coming up next. So how do you get started with DICOM CAST? Couple things, I've shown you that, you know, deploy to Azure button, you just simply click that thing and you're off and running. Now, that's gonna get you part of the way there. It's gonna give you an example. But if you wanna dive in and really dig into both the code, the configuration, how to move your own things in um, to the standard, there's two ways. And I'm gonna point you to Docker and Azure. Um, there's guidance for engineers. If you're, if you're looking to get started with developing on the medical imaging server for DICOM, um, there's you know, the full test suite and everything you can pull down locally. But more importantly, you can pull it locally and do your, your developer inner loop can be very, very fast because you can run it locally. Or you can deploy the whole thing to Azure as well. Get involved. Deploy the solution, play with it, but also think about working with HL7 and, and the DICOM committee if you're in that. And then please check out the documentation. Here's some contacts. Reach out to me on LinkedIn and I'll be in the Whova app. Please don't hesitate to, to contact me. And Gustav, I'm coming in hot at five minutes remaining for questions and Q&A. I'd love to open that it was, up for Q&A. That was perfect, perfect landing. So yeah. there are some questions which were voted on. So the first question, what most votes is, is there a publicly available library doing the mapping from DICOM header to fire? Or is this published as part of this specific DICOM server? So there is, um, there, there is a recommendation as part of DICOM standard and work group 20 for what gets pushed into the, the fire imaging study. So that's, that's well structured today. Um, from as far as code goes to push it in, there are several folks who have, who have built it out, out on GitHub. In our particular implementation, um, we take a configuration file and push that over. It, we, you know, we take our own things. It's, it's built into the DICOM server, our, our, our DICOM cast implementation to push it into the fire service. Um, there's not a, a pure mapping that I've seen that's just, that's just that component. Um, that, of okay. course, you could always, download our OSS repo, pull out that one container and that that could do it. Um, but uh, that, yeah, it's part of our repo today. Okay. Um, it's so important the other, to be part of this The game. other question is, is DICOM cast a different a trouble the interoperability spec as fire cast for context sharing between fire and DICOM? So the comparison <laughs> to fire cast. Yeah, I, uh, um, that's a really good question. I, it, Firecast um, is, a, is a little bit different, and and the DICOM cast name wasn't meant to uh, to align with Firecast, unfortunately. Um, a little bit of maybe crossed uh, crossed things on naming, but uh, a Firecast is distinct from DICOM cast, and DICOM cast isn't a a standard like Firecast is. You know, Firecast is a way of of interoperability with Fire. A DICOM cast is not a standard like the Firecast effort is today. Um, one other question that I see here on the report is, could I share the architectural diagram and sequence? And I would love to share the uh, these slides. So I'll be providing them to Gustav. And Gustav, is there a way to share those with all of the attendees then? Yeah, well, we can upload them to uh, to Wuva as far as I know, but I'll, I'll clarify that. Yep. Um, another great question that I see here is the Power BI connector available for public use? Absolutely. This is part of Power BI. It was uh, built by um, a couple folks on, on our team, Michael Hansen and, and uh, John Stairs worked together and got it built and shipped out. And, and they, they got it all the way into the Power BI. If you download Power BI desktop, the one that runs locally, that's how you connect uh, data sources. You just need to type fire and you can connect. It connects to any compliant fire server. Um, they can communicate with Azure Active Directory. Uh, there's some limitations on Power BI that, that, that require that type of authentication, Azure Active Directory. Um, but I mean, if you can communicate that way, it'll connect to any fire server, absolutely. 
Okay, so we've got another question. One, one more minute. Um, any thoughts on how converting structure report content into fire would work? What resource types would it that map to? That sort of. That's a that's a really big question. Yeah, um, yeah, it it is it is a big question, and a lot of those things in a structured report are going to be mapped to many different resources in fire. Um, there, there's potentially a diagnostic report, which would be not final. Um, that would be in, in, in there. It could also be moved into observations. Um, there's recommendations for um, drugs and medications that would fall under that in fire. Um, structured reports can cover an awful lot of ground um, and they everything from prescribing drugs all the way through to recommending treatment plans. So um, it's a challenge. Um, I'll leave it at that. I think it's going to yeah. take longer than a minute to cover. So I, yeah. I'd love to talk more in detail, uh, but it's, woof, it's, it's where there's going to be a challenge for sure. Great. So um, really, thanks a lot. Great talk. Um, Steve, it was really a pleasure to be here. So I'd ask the attendees to uh, rate the talk. That would be great. Um, and we'll stay online for the next five minutes so that we'll be able to answer questions. So Steve and I will be here for the next five minutes and then we'll close the session. So um, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Gustav. And thanks all of you who attended as well. It was a pleasure and I look forward to talking with you on the Whova app and uh, in person, hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, make a connection and we'll chat. I'll give you my private email at that point because it won't go right. up on YouTube. Right. At that so yeah, that was really good, um, Steve. So I was sort of wondering while we wait for a few follow-up questions. So you could answer these questions uh, after the call, I mean, later on, if you follow up on them. Um, I had one question sort of, um, so, so the DICOM query service, which is sort of part of DICOM web. Um, so if you, I really like the metaphor where you said, you know, the fire server is the one solid repository um, about all that's medical about a patient. So that's, people keep forgetting that fire is also a persistence layer. Um, so how, how would you combine the queries? If you want to query a DICOM object, do you do with, with the querying the fire resource per se? I love that question, Gustav. You went, you, you, you drilled right into, right into the, the, the core oh. element of this. And it's, and the answer is it's not, that, that, that query that I gave you, yeah. I can't get it answered with the fire query language. It's too convoluted and has too much, all the data's in fire, but I can't get that question answered in a query in, in the fire query language. And I most certainly can't get it answered in Keto, which is the DICOM query language or CFINE. Yeah. Um, it's, just, it's just not powerful enough. And um, I would really like to see um, some standardization layer um, for querying um, really complex queries against the yeah. data that exists. Um, I know it's already fire query is really complicated. Yeah. It's very complex. Did, did, did you watch the talk on GraphQL? So there was a talk on GraphQL. Mm. I did. With, that was a brilliant talk. Absolutely. Yeah, so I was thinking about, I, I mean, this is the one, I, I think somebody came up with that uh, issue uh, of combining the queries here for DICOM. That was my sort of short nightmare contact with uh, <laughs> DICOM web. And I, when I watched the uh, GraphQL talk, I thought, wow, one, one could write an adapter for that. Maybe that would be one approach. I do want to say after that talk, I quickly went out and got DICOM mesh and I threw it against our Azure, the, the Fire API and the DICOM API. And it's not that hard to connect the two. Um, so yeah. it, GraphQL might be a great language. Um, the difficulty is it's not a been standardized. Um, and I think that's one of the things that makes it a little bit more difficult um, yeah. and a medical standard. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, yeah, exactly. So you know, I, think we could, I think we've we've waited our obligatory five minutes. So I think we were actually, yeah, that was great. So really I, pleasure to, to be with you here. Steve, and um, uh, I think I'll, I'll, 
hook up with you, link up with you on LinkedIn. That sounds wonderful, Gustav. And thanks for that really insightful question right at the end. I love it. Um, oh, okay. Wonderful day. It was fantastic to present and enjoy your evening. Thanks. You too. Bye, Gustav. Bye-bye.